Welcome to Engagement Fundraising, where you'll learn how busy fundraisers like you are generating more major and planned gifts at lower costs. Brought to you by iMarketSmart.com, the software and services company that helps nonprofits raise more money more efficiently. If you are always asking, you're going to get diminishing returns. If you're providing value and making people feel good, then when you ask, they'll be more likely to respond. Hi there. Welcome to Engage in Fundraising. I'm Tim Chen, Marketing Solutionist at MarketSmart. On today's episode, I sit down with Greg Warner to discuss email as a fundraising tool, how to use it in a way donors love, how to use it to track engagement, some pitfalls to avoid, and much more. Not sure what engagement fundraising is or how to use email effectively? Well, you will soon. All right, Tim. How's it going, Greg? <laughs> it is good. It's sunny. It's happy. It's, uh, it's a good day to raise some money. What do you think? Uh, I, I agree. Yeah. Let's raise some money. Let's, let's teach people about email. All right. Email. Email. Email, it's so easy, right? It's so just, easy. You just hit a button just and a button. It, it just goes. No post office. It's just there instantly. It's just there. It's so easy. It's there unless you're spam. No, you can do it if you're spam. It's okay. Sure, yeah. It's okay. It just they might not see you it. You can burn your list. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. You can always get another job. Yeah. So, so Greg, <laughs> you probably get a lot of emails from nonprofits, as do I. What are the big things you notice that they're doing wrong? What would... What are the big stumbling blocks? Ooh. There's a lot of them. I mean, a lot of a lot of email out there. <laughs> a lot of it? email out there. It's yeah. A lot of email. Okay, so let's. I I don't want to focus on negatives. So we're gonna just we're gonna we're gonna focus on the negatives for a short period of time, and then we'll focus on positives. Cause yeah, that sounds good. But uh, we'll start off with me bashing a lot <laughs> of stuff, right? Because you know me, I yell around the office when I see dumb stuff happening. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And that happens quite a lot, not because of our staff, but because the emails I get from my beloved charities, they really know how to drive people away sometimes. Some of them are really, really amazingly good at it. But, but a lot of times they're not. A lot of times they're not. And you know what? I believe that a lot of it is not the fundraiser's fault in fact, it's that they are getting a lot of pressure from the board and their, their bosses and whomever to just make it rain. And the easiest and cheapest way to do that is to just blast out an email and get some results. But you get diminishing returns if you don't do it right and if you're not invested in a long-term strategy. So as far as just sending out emails, what strategy should these nonprofits ah, be ah, working towards? But, but you know what? So we forgot about what they're doing wrong. So let me start with what they're doing wrong, and then we'll get to how they can use it correctly. First, blasting email to ask for money all the time is kind of like having a really crappy cousin who comes over your house all the time asking for money. And he doesn't just ring the doorbell. He just walks in and sits on your couch. Okay? It's not cool. He's probably eating some, eating some of your food while he's doing that too. And he's eating some of your food. Right? Yeah. That's the high level of what they're doing wrong. Okay. He's asking for money. If that's all you are is the cousin that comes over and asks for money all the time and it's always urgent and there's always a catastrophe and the world is going to end, what are you going to think about that cousin after a couple times that that happens? They're a downer. I don't want to be around them and they're uh, yeah. sucking my life from me. So here's the core component of really all fundraising, but especially engagement fundraising, is that people give because they want to feel good period mm -hmm. end of story okay yeah. there's no such thing as pure altruism no such thing unless you know when you have pure altruism is when someone steals your money and you don't know it yes <laughs> then <laughs> then you have become altruistic because you you don't feel good you don't you don't, you don't know you gave yeah sure because if you feel good if you know that you gave money away 
and you feel good. Now, there goes altruism. It's done. You're not altruistic, are you? No. <laughs> we just went high-level philosophical there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so fundraisers, do people feel good when they use urgency and fear tactics of this thing happened, we're in trouble? If used sparingly. If used sparingly. Not every single time. That's right. In fact, very successful with disasters or certain events or elections. So then you get the email and you feel good because you're making it happen. Yeah. But if it's always urgent, uh, not so much. Most email should be used for engagement purposes, not for asking purposes. Yeah. There's a, a great book called Mega Gifts by Gerald Panis. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great book. Everybody should read it. It's probably, I don't know, 25 years old 50 years old i don't know how old it is i got it over here i bought it used and it is old with a capital o somebody who is a board member was talking to jerry panis so he describes in his book and he says that she told him that a donor should be thanked and thanked at least seven times before they've been asked for a gift again now i love that but I think that is a little disingenuous, you know, after the... Yeah, we do the three-to-one pad. The three-to-one pads have check boxes, and you write the person's name down who gave you a gift, preferably a major gift we're talking about here. But even if you're in lower dollar fundraising, you should use the same principle of re law of re reciprocity to give to people. In other words, they gave you a gift. Now you want to thank them. You want to provide for them some report of the impact that occurred because of the donation and finally give them an opportunity for engagement or involvement with the organization. So that could be a video, that could be typing something on a virtual wall, you know, a message or sharing something. So at least those three things, the thank you, the update, and the opportunity for deeper involvement. Awesome. And if you want those pads, you can go to imarketsmart.com slash 321, and we'll send out um, some pads to you for your charge. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, you, you do that. It's pretty great. <laughs> if you are always asking, you're going to get diminishing returns. If you're providing value and making people feel good, then when you ask, they'll be more likely to respond. And does that include having the ask as part of a PS? Like if it's a PS and not a direct ask in the main content part, should that be excluded as well in, in this kind of philosophy? We're getting into tactics. So we go from strategy to tactics. Usually I like to talk one or the other. But let's, let's just hit this real quick with tactics, is that generally there should be one thing that you're doing in any engagement. Mm -hmm. So if your offer is to report back the impact, then the PS should be aligned with that. <laughs> Don't try and mix three, four different offers and think to yourself, well, gee whiz, we're emailing them anyway, so we may as well ask. No, I'm sorry. No. N O. No. Yeah, because that dilutes the, the main purpose of that email. That's right. And again, I feel your pain. I'm sure you out there listening are getting pressure that you've got to ask, ask, ask. You've got to ask at some point. You really do, or you're not going to get the revenue. I'm just saying there's a careful balance between providing value and making people feel good and asking. And your ask email will be more powerful if you don't do it every time. Exactly. It is very tricky. This is a strategic and philosophical concept. And it's very tricky, especially considering the powers that are influencing decisions to press that button. But once you can at least get buy-in from the top that this needs to be measured, then your chances for success are that much greater. As far as spam, a lot of nonprofits probably struggle with being on some spam lists because what should nonprofits do to avoid being on that? Is it using certain words in your subject or... 
what what's what gets them into trouble with that? Well, there's a couple of different things. So first of all, you're talking about being reported as spam by the end user and then getting distilled, if you will, from the email, the server in the cloud level, let's say. Yeah, like Gmail will automatically put you in the spam filter. Yeah, so there's those two things. There's the... There's and the user could opt out uh, with the spam. Not even opt out, but report you as spam. That's not right. a good thing. Right. So for the one, let's call it with the distillation in the cloud, because that could be just in the company server that's in the closet or Gmail or something, you know, just on the browser. The, the thing is that there are certain words that will trigger your emails to be thought of as spam. OK, like free. <laughs> right. You know, um, a Viagra. Uh, Viagra, <laughs> right, right. So I won't go through all those because there's lists online and you can you can just google it and there's tons of of those. Uh, more importantly though is trying to n ensure that people don't mark you as spam and one of the easiest ways is and this is going to sound so simple, but I'm sorry this happens a lot at nonprofits is that when people unsubscribe, unsubscribe them. Don't add them back in. Don't make the decision for them that, oh, gosh, my I don't want my list to get small and maybe they didn't mean to. No, no, no. They meant to. <laughs> they, they meant to unsubscribe. Yeah. Don't email people that unsubscribed. That will get you marked as spam. They'll be angry. I know I'm angry when I hit unsubscribe and I still get emails. Yeah. It's just not fair. Look, let me let me say it again, and, and we're going to say it on this podcast a lot. In fact, probably every episode. If you want money from donors, make them feel good. It's that simple. It's that simple. If you don't unsubscribe them when they ask to be unsubscribed, that doesn't feel good. It's not fair. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. As far as drafting that email, subject lines, and what what. What should be the verbiage asking them, like with reports, giving them an update on how, how X nonprofit's doing? Is it a personal thing? Look how your funds impacted okay. this project? or So all of this, when it gets to subject lines and how long should your email be and things like that, all of that will be determined by the recipients of your emails. Here's what I mean. By testing. You've got to test subject lines. Here's the simplest test that you can do with any decent-sized email blast that you're going to do. Let's suppose you're going to blast 10,000 emails, mm -hmm. right? So you really should take 500, maybe 250 of an A test and 250 of B. Whatever it is to see which subject line, and only test one thing. Don't t change anything else. Which subject line is the winner? Once you know... <laughs> that then do the blast but too many times there's somebody who doesn't know anything about email mm -hmm. and maybe they even read a blog on great subject lines so they used a subject line that they th were told was a good subject line and then they blast all 10,000 you don't know if that subject line is good for your list on this day at this time for this offer you just don't know yeah that might have worked for somebody else but it doesn't necessarily mean it works for you so you have a different audience it's totally everything's different yeah. look the time of day changes whether it works or not so you got to test before you hit that button learn more about us here at imarketsmart.com in this quick break This week, I want to encourage everyone to download our free report on how to write letters to major donors. You can find it for free at imarketsmart.com slash donor letters. Here's what you'll learn from downloading and reading this report. You'll learn what you need to know before you begin writing your letter, how to design the letter to be scanned before it's read, how to include a clear call to action that gets you the responses you're looking for, how to make the letter about the donor and what they can do, how much to ask for, and much more. All of this available for free. Get your copy by going to imarketsmart.com slash donor letters. That's www.imarketsmart.com slash donor letters. frequency how often should you bug your not bug but you, sh you shouldn't be bugging them yeah. you should be adding should, to their life okay so how frequency, often should you be adding to their life yeah never never bug 
you know, uh, did you send that that gift? Yeah, I've gotten those kinds of emails. I've gotten an email saying we haven't received your donation yet this year. Last year, and they get even cute. They get cute and they say, last year you sent it on April twenty first. It is now June twenty third. We have not received your donation yet. Shame, <laughs> right? Guilt, yeah. What is not that? Not feeling good. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> now, I think it would be cool to send a great offer and in the top right-hand corner, just subtly say your last gift was on such and such. Maybe that's a little nicer. Sure. That's a nice reminder. Yeah. That's helpful. That made me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see, you were asking how frequently, is that what you were asking? Yeah, yeah. How often should you be emailing your supporters? So here's something interesting about Market Smart. And I understand we're talking to fundraisers. Market Smart is a private company. Yeah. But we have emails going out to often the same people almost every single day. Mm -hmm. And many of these people. Never unsubscribe, not because it's just going into some junk bin. People write me emails back <laughs> yeah, saying that they love these emails. They appreciate them. They print them out. I had one woman who used them in board meetings. You know, another person sent me pictures of things that were posted on her wall, right? Yeah. Because they're providing value and they make them feel good. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't ask them to buy from us all the time. Yeah. Uh, I would like them to. But But may I just like the emails. But what I'm trying to say is we can send emails to a large number of people who have asked for them Mm -hmm. every single day. Now, on Tuesdays, it's our motivational quotes, major gift motivator series. Every Tuesday, you get a free motivational quote. Yep. We just sent our 100th one, I think, uh, this week. 100th one, right. Yeah. And the list, interestingly, is growing. It just yeah. keeps growing. It gets bigger and bigger. And people really un- unsubscribe. And that's like, for instance, one of the ones where someone sent me a picture and they're posted on our wall. It's fantastic. And people share those. I mean, thousands of views all over the place because they share them online. Okay. So that's one. Our blog goes out three times a week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're providing value and making people feel good, you can send almost daily emails. Have them unique enough where it's not the same exact thing every time, and it's valuable to them. But now, this is kind of unrealistic. I don't want people to misunderstand this because, you know, next thing you know, the nonprofit sending emails, be careful. Get some outsider uh, feedback. I would well, probably test recommend. Them. Yeah, and, test and them. And look yeah. at the number of unsubscribes. You want mm-hmm. your open and click through rate. And, and I know you're going to want to ask me about that yeah. metrics and whatnot. But you need to know that those emails are truly making people feel good. Yeah. The proof is in the pudding. So you want to ask me about metrics? I can, yeah. <laughs> I first wanted to know, so frequency, more engaged supporters, people that donate on a more regular basis, should you be sending them more emails? Depends. And actually, so let's come back to that because we're going to talk about the metrics and, and engagement because you can send more emails or you might want to send more emails when people are more engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's, of course, dovetailing into engagement fundraising and measuring and capturing the donor's digital body language and their digital body language is going to turn into metrics. Yeah. So you're looking at click is click rate with the the end all be all. I mean, they need to open it, of course, to even see it. Well, you've got opens. Mm -hmm. First, you've got deliveries. Then you got opens, then you have click-throughs, and frankly, none of those are even anywhere near as valuable as engagement. But nobody talks about engagement. Uh, Yeah, well, where's that in your mail, Jim? You know why nobody talks about engagement? It's it's an amazing, your head is going to go... Something MailChimp can't track. That's it. (laughs) Thank right? you. Yeah, you need some kind of cookie on your website that would link it to the email, and yeah. it's, it's hard, to, talks it's hard about to do. It yeah. Because most people don't have that synced with their email. So why would MailChimp want to talk about it? It's not even in their realm. It's, it's not in their paradigm. It's not in their dimension. So everything you read about emails talks about deliveries, opens, and click-throughs. Yeah. 
But it doesn't matter. Because they could click and bounce really quick if they wanted to. They can click and bounce. That's right. Are they important? Sure, they're important. You want to look at those metrics. But first of all, the open rates are not even reliable because many browsers open up emails automatically or on your phone. Yeah. You know, you just open it for a second. It's not a real open. It doesn't it's mean not... you're reading it. It's not a read rate. It's no. a lot of people have Outlook open in the background and it'll just open the latest email. Yeah. Yeah. So why are we looking at that? And then the click through rate is based on the open. Yeah. So then that's off. It's all fun and games, but here's where the rubber hits the road is in engagement. Did they watch the video? How long? Did they share the video on Facebook? Did they fill out the form? Did they donate? Did they click on the button that says take our donor survey? These are the things that you want to measure. Engagement. Engagement is the key. That's why I called it engagement fundraising. Go figure. Mind blowing. How do people start to track that? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, so you've got to have your email tied to a system. Of course, I'm biased. Ours is really the only one that's specifically developed for fundraising and especially for major gifts and plan gift fundraising and moving mid-level donors up. But you've got to be able to tie your outreach with your engagement and have a dashboard that monitors all of that together. Yeah. But especially that scores the digital body language, which I is my other word for engagement online. Yeah. And the reason why I like to call it digital body language instead of just engagement sometimes is because digital body language is telling. Mm -hmm. Engagement is just like, oh, yeah, they engaged. Well, digital body language tells you what they're really interested in. Let's suppose a person clicks on the donor advised fund link. Sure. And his name is David. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, you get a $10,000 gift that was recommended by David for his donor advised fund to send you. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Now you connect the dots and you know that the email that you sent provided so much value and made David feel so good or inspired him so much that he decided to click on that link and give that money. And it may even help you because sometimes donor advised fund gifts can be anonymous. So you might be able to connect the dots there but if he clicked on that link and he didn't make the recommendation for the transfer of funds, mm -hmm. then maybe that means that he's on sort of a list of people who needs to understand more about how they can realize their philanthropic goals by giving from a, their donor advised fund. Yeah. And having a dashboard find what's going on on your site, seeing all of that digital body language. Well, you could put David in a bucket with 612 other people who have also done that in the past week. And then frankly, you could turn that into a direct mail and email campaign mm -hmm. to just to those 612 people, helping them understand how they can give. It's really a recommendation splitting hairs here with donor advised funds, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So yeah, segmenting, you, you're able to do that more effectively through using a good system that can track that engagement score. Right. Tracking what people are actually doing after they open and click through is the key to segmentation. You have to know what they're really doing. Yeah, because it's going to be a lot more useful than, say, sending an email to people just based on their age. Well, usually it's based on things like their past giving history. You know, did they give? Did they not give? How much did they give? Look, and this always ties into the donor survey when you're talking about segmentation because you've got to find out why people care, what kind of gifts they'd be interested in, what programs interest them. And those are the keys to start off your segmentation, frankly. It should all start with a survey. Yeah. As we talked about last episode. Yes. All about the survey. Yes. And then the survey brings you in the email to cultivate and help these leads become more involved and engaged with your nonprofit. Yes. Indeed. So what's Yesware? What is that? What is that? Okay. Yesware is one of many types of notification software tools, and you can get it for free, especially if you're just using Gmail at your nonprofit, you can get it for free. So when you send an email to a donor, and, and this is more for a major gift officer or a legacy gift officer, let's suppose you send a proposal to somebody to fund repairing the playground. Sure. 
Yeah. If that person clicks on it two days later, you won't know unless you're using a tool like Yesware. So it's a powerful tool to know that they're clicking on it. They are clicking on it multiple times. Usually, if they're clicking on it multiple times, that means they're interested in it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they flagged that email most likely. It's in their inbox. Yeah. And now, if they tell you, oh, you know what? I'll be going away for a little while. I'll get back in touch with you on this. Then three weeks goes by and you see that they're clicking on it. Guess what? That's a good time to reach out to them. So you can either call them or send them an email. Hey, David, I just wanted to check in on that. And your likelihood of getting a response is much greater. So it's a great little tool. It's something we'll probably build into our system eventually because most of what we're doing is automated emails. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not entirely necessary right now, but people might want to take a look at Yesware in the interim. Thanks for listening to this episode of Engagement Fundraising. If you like the show, make sure to review it on iTunes and pass it along to a friend or colleague. If you're curious about what we do, Make sure to check out imarketsmart.com and download our free resource for writing great donor letters. That's found at www.imarketsmart.com slash donor letters. We'll be back next Thursday to discuss the four selves of engagement fundraising.